Well, hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Political State Podcast from the Oklahoman. I'm Ben Felder. Today is Friday, March 1st, and joining me in studio this week is State Senator Julia Kurt from Northwest Oklahoma City. Senator, thanks so much for your time. Welcome back to Political State. Glad to be here. Well, we uh, keep moving along with the legislative session. Uh, we hit a deadline this week of bills having to get out of their committees of origin. And so, um, you know, there'll be another deadline in, in the weeks to come. And, and the session's kind of nearing the maybe the, the first end or the end of that kind of first chapter. Um, I got some specific questions on things that we've seen through, seen go through, uh, some things that you've been involved in. But my, my first question, I guess, for you this week is just, you know, how would you assess, you know, your first couple of months in the legislature is your first your first year in office? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a really um, intense process and, you know, it's hard to even get a minute to uh, process mentally. And I think that's been a big challenge I've talked to my fellow freshmen about is just there's no transition time and mm -hmm. every issue is important and everyone needs you right now. Um, I, I, I've been telling my nonprofit friends it feels a little like having a, a huge event all day long uh -huh. with important decisions at the end. So, um, But Carrie Hicks, Senator Hicks, says that it's just like being in the classroom. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've talked to her before. She said, you know, there's a lot of things that are similar about it. You got to, especially that kind of first day of school, the first day of session, she was saying, um, you know, kind of building relationships with your students, you, you know, maybe other lawmakers kind of getting to know them. But you come from a nonprofit background, which you said, I mean, what, what's similar and what's different from, from your experience in the nonprofit but sector? Certainly working together, trying to find ways to work together. It's all about relationships. And, you know, you can say that, but in, in actuality, it's just we're all individuals trying to learn who each other are, trying to learn where each person came from. You know, the first week I was just trying to remember names, yeah. you know who everyone was, but now I'm trying to learn about their, what do I know about their communities? What do I know about their interests? And you're learning um, your fellow senators first. Someday I'll learn the house as well. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, what they care about and how, what their approach is to being a legislator. So it, it affects how you communicate with each other. What's been the most surprising aspect of the job for you? Um, just the, I mean, I knew the pace of bills coming through, but I didn't quite realize how challenging it is to be thorough in that process. We rely very heavily on the due diligence of the author of the bill and whoever worked with them to create that bill. Um, in committee, you might be hearing 20 to 50 bills. Uh, you know, on the floor, they move very quickly. If you don't ask your questions quickly, they're moving on because we have so much to cover. So. Um, I think that was a little disconcerting to me as someone who loves to research and spend yeah. time with topics. Um, I knew it would be a challenge to stay informed and ask good questions, and, and it is. Yeah, I, you know, I think about every kind of new chapter in my life, whether it's going to college or a new career, there's always that kind of new early early nerves and you're not sure how you're supposed to act and, you know, even just speaking out or asking questions can sometimes be difficult that first time. How has that process been like for you? Is yeah, that's, uh, you know, I actually, my undergrad was in communication studies. Okay. And so I have a real interest yeah. in groups and how they communicate with each other. So I'm, I'm very self-aware throughout it. Um, and, you know, groups want to get along generally, mm -hmm. even though we have a adversarial and sometimes tense process. So it is hard to raise questions and not feel like you're challenging someone and um, establish the trust to be able to ask each other hard questions and have it not feel personal. Um, and I, you know, I don't know my place in that yet. Uh, you know, I was certainly involved in groups where we had a lot of time to build mm -hmm. that trust around each topic. Um, so I think that's going to be hard. It's hard to vote no, frankly. Mm -hmm. I was surprised. I thought it'd be easier to vote no on things. Um, but it really feels like you're denying somebody's intention with their bill or that they may have done a lot of research on if you vote no. So it, it feels like a bigger decision than I thought it would be. Yeah. What's been the biggest kind of confidence booster in the early months? Has there been a moment or, or, or a process that kind of helps you, you know, develop more confidence or kind of develop your voice? Or that's I'm sure that's an ongoing process. Yeah, but. it's ongoing. I mean, building some relationships with some uh, veteran senators is helping. Certainly my caucus, we have a small caucus, nine Democrats, um, and they're incredibly supportive. So the veterans, um, our leaders, incredibly well-respected, Senator K. Floyd, there's nobody in the building that I've found that doesn't respect her and know that she has good intentions and that she's thorough. And that helps because she's a great example to us, but also people trust us uh, more because of her. Um, I've built, you know, I've already got a good rapport with quite a few of my um, senators who have experience. Um, Senator Roger Thompson, who's the appropriations chair, is incredibly welcoming to freshmen. He's not partisan about it at all. He walked me through the budget. You know, I felt like I was wasting <laughs> his time, but he said he wants us to know what's going on with the appropriations process. So that's a confidence booster. Um, you know, just constituents being pleased and proud. You know, so not everyone's happy with me, but to have people um, who are just glad that I'm there working hard 
it means a lot. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, the small numbers for the Democrats in the Senate, uh, nine members. So when there are partisan issues, there's really not much the Democrats can do to stop the flow flow of bills. So I want to ask you, what's your role in knowing that your objection to an issue for the most part is not going to be successful in, in if the goal is to, to stop that bill? And and one of the things I'm thinking of particularly is this week during, the, during a committee hearing, um, the President Pro Tem Treat had a series of bills that did away with uh, five state agency boards, uh, gave the governor the, the power to hire these directors, and um, you were one of the members that asked the most questions, and you voted against it. I'm sure you go, you're going in knowing that your no vote isn't going to you know, swing this a, as, a, as a rejection. It, it passed through handily. But what do you feel like your role is if you know there's an issue that there's not much you can do to stop it? Um, I'm sure you, have, you actually do legitimately have questions, but what is your role as a member of the minority um, when you're asking questions, when you know, hey, I'm, I'm not going to be able to stop this bill, but I still want to play a part of the process? Yeah, I, you know, I don't have clarity on that yet since it's happened so infrequently. That was the first time I've really um, asked a lot of questions of an author, and, and to have it be the pro tem was especially intense for me. Um, I respect him, and he's been a very solid and fair leader. Uh, to the Senate. So asking him questions was hard for me. Um, but, you know, that's actually, I, I'm finding that there's issues that I just can't be quiet about. Mm -hmm. If I feel like our constituents and our state are real, it's very important to government. It's very important to the values um, that I see in government. Um, transparency is actually something I talked about a lot on the doors. Um, I had so many voters tell me that they don't trust our government and that they're worried there's lots of corruption. And so I'm su even more attuned to concerns to making sure the public knows what's going on, that decisions aren't being made behind closed doors. So when it, that issue came up, it was very clear to me that I had to ask lots of questions. You know, yeah, the bills might move right through, but I want to make sure that the public, that the media know that this is a concern, make clear how I think it's going to impact the process. Um, so I think at the very least this week, my yeah. job was to make sure the narrative wasn't solely about the agenda. Um, you know, I, I know the points that the governor and uh, Senator Stitt, I mean, Senator Treat are making yeah. about um, trying to help agencies function better. Um, but I just want to make sure when we're talking about serving 4 million people, make sure that we have the transparency that it's respectful throughout the decisions. It's not just a once a year budget mm -hmm. decision but that there's some understanding of what the people need and built-in feedback in that process. Yeah, and I haven't had a chance to see you in action every time in a, in a committee meeting or on the floor, but you know, I did notice that that moment that we're talking about and, and that committee meeting this week. And and you mentioned, you know, you're asking questions of the this, you know, the Senate President Pro Tem, you know, the most powerful person in the Senate. Um, it was very uh, collegial, you know, back and forth between you. But was that kind of a? I mean, were you nervous about that oh, moment? Yeah. Or absolutely. I mean. In fact, I didn't think I was going to ask so many questions, but then we got committee substituted bills the mm -hmm. night before. So, you know, they can substitute um, up until the last minute, really. And that so I felt especially on guard because we hadn't had a chance to read things. Um, and I really feel like it's my responsibility, especially with committee bills, that I spend time with them and know what changes are being made in the law. Um, you know, we had one bill, the transportation bill was, you know, 200 pages long probably yeah. and I only got to read the first couple of pages and that doesn't feel responsible to me in terms of my role representing the public and also our role serving the state um, so there was a moment there where I said I really need to ask questions this morning and I need it to be um, thorough and luckily our leader Kate Floyd was there to present mm -hmm. a bill and so I kind of checked that with her because I was thinking like, oh, gosh, you know, is this OK for me to ask these questions? And she said, you have questions. You ask them. You think it's important. You bring it up. It doesn't matter who it is presenting the bill. Um, so she encouraged me. And I think having her there helped that process because, I mean, that's one thing about being a Democrat in the Senate is you only have one or two of you on each <laughs> committee. Yeah. And I talk to my Republican colleagues. I do. But there's a different approach to some of these issues. And that that specific issue is one that, that is hard on the GOP agenda. <clears throat> yeah. So, yeah, it was an intense process. My uh, heart rate was up. My adrenaline <laughs> was up. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't fumble around too much. So I ended up feeling OK about it. And I and and it's not personal. Yeah. You know, it's a professional line and it's a, a public policy decision. So I'm trying to make sure that I keep that in mind. 
Yeah, and I wasn't trying to imply that you, you you appeared to be nervous or anything like that. I thought you actually handled it pretty pretty well, and you kind of look like a seasoned pro out there uh, with your with your questions. Um, you know, one of the transitions for you, you know, coming into office, is that you've you've spent you know the majority of the last you know eighteen months, I think, you know, running you know for the seat. So very intimately aware of the issues in your district, talking to voters on the doorsteps. You know, and now for the last couple months, you probably primarily have been inside the Capitol. What has that transition been like, and how are you staying plugged in with constituents that you knew very well over the last, you know, year plus that maybe you haven't had a a chance to, you know, obviously walk the streets as much? Yeah, I actually last night was really missing some neighborhoods. Um, You know, those conversations on people's doorsteps, you get an honesty and a perspective that's that's really valuable. So I was trying to kind of reminisce about I was thinking about that trust in government thing, because that's one that shocked me on the doors how many people brought up their concerns that there was corruption, that there were um, the good old boy system was, you know, people were earning money off of it. Um, I That's not one of my big concerns going into running, but because my constituents were so concerned about it, trust became a bigger part of what, what I'm emphasizing. So I was trying to reminisce about that and be like, oh, yeah, they did tell me that was yeah. important to them. Um, I have had people come to the Capitol. I think people would be surprised how few people call the office or hmm. come by. Um, I, I thought I, we would be more inundated. Um, not that there's a lot of time um, in there, but I thought that we would see a lot more people. So um, some of the hot button issues this week, I just didn't get as many messages as I thought I might. Um, so I just encourage people to reach out to your legislators. Um, don't assume they know where you're coming from. I thought maybe some people weren't reaching out to me because they thought they knew where I'd stand on things. Hmm. Um, but I think it's important for us to be able to say how many people are contacting us about an issue yeah. and have that f- ha- feel kind of backed up by the voices. But the thing is, having knocked all those doors, you know, I knocked on 20,000 doors. I am not swayed by special interest focused communication. So if I get a bunch of um, messages on a topic, but I can tell it's all driven by one advocacy group. I'm aware that there are other voices out there that aren't being heard. Mm -hmm. And so I think knocking on doors helped me have that awareness. And I'm aware that I was only talking to voters. So there's all these other people we're serving who aren't even active voters. Um, So I try to always keep that in mind. What's your what's your relationship been like with advocacy groups and lobbyists? I mean, as you you come in as a new lawmaker and they're wanting to get acquainted with you and, you know, maybe looking at you, hey, this is a freshman. Maybe there's some things that we can take advantage. I mean, what's what were what's some advice you received on how to handle that and how have you handled it? You know, I mean, they're an incredibly important part of the system, especially with term limits like there are. We have a lot we need to learn quickly. Um, They are able to provide us information, perspective. You know, we might have, uh, you know, 40 bills on an agenda. And if I don't have somebody telling me the pros and cons, I might not get to that. Um, I might only read the research and current statute and not have time to analyze what are the pros and cons of this bill. So they're incredibly useful. Um, Obviously, they have um, specific things they're trying to push, and I'm aware when it's kind of a grassroots movement versus just um, paid lobbyists, which paid lobbyists I'm not in any way denigrating because they're a really important part of the process. They're up there all the time. They're very informed, and most of them are incredibly honest. So what I was told um, during orientation, I think it was Senator Paxton said, always ask a lobbyist what the opponents are saying. Um, And all the honest lobbyists will give you a real picture of what the uh, other side says so that you you know the whole picture and not just what they're promoting you know yeah so as you look ahead the next next few weeks what are what are going to be some key uh key issues for you bills uh, topics that you're honing in on i mean what's the next well i just have one bill alive which is related to the cultural districts program Uh great program that the oklahoma arts council does across the state i really wanted to emphasize it and, and draw more attention and accountability to it for community so i'll be continuing to push that um, you know, it was something comfortable for me because I have that background and understand this area well. It's been a great way to talk to my colleagues about their communities because, you know, they represent all these interesting communities that have unique downtowns or unique mm-hmm. creative assets or artists or uh, museums. And it's and it's fun to get to talk to them. So that'll be one thing. I'll, that'll be a thread just getting to yeah. try to get that heard on the well, Senate floor. Well, tell us about that bill a little bit. Um, so it's called the Cultural Districts Initiative Act. It really just formalizes the program um, that's already been in place as a pilot for years. Um, it's the Oklahoma Arts Council works with communities to plan around their cultural and arts assets. So they assess, um, they provide t- technical assistance to help them assess who are the artists in their communities. What are those unique cultural assets? You know, one of the great things about all our communities is they have different histories. They mm-hmm. have different residents. You look at the architecture, you might look at artists that live in the town, you might look at the cultural history, 
um, you know, our black towns or our native um, tribes. And you really can analyze what makes us unique that we can promote. And that program does a really good job of helping them plan and build around those assets. Um, I think, you know, if you don't have time, if you don't have the energy, if you don't have that expertise, you might end up just doing things that other communities are doing instead of saying, what's our unique voice here? I had a really fun conversation with the Lieutenant Governor, Matt Pinnell, about mm-hmm. this bill. And um, Judd Strom is my uh, house author. He's Representative Strom. He's brand new. He's from the Bartlesville area, very rural part of, out, out there. Um, you know, they're both just so excited about what's happening across the state. And, of course, um, Lieutenant Governor immediately sees it as a tourism opportunity because mm-hmm. he's like, oh, what's that brand? What's that yeah. local brand? And certainly we need to reemphasize cultural assets. Yeah. What if, What's the tone towards kind of, you know, arts and culture? Because, you know, there's, there's been a period recently – um, in the state house, where there has been kind of a skeptical eye, and I think a lot of that is, is funding driven. There was a, you know, there's, you, you saw the state enact, uh, you know, requirements that certain percentage of budgets for new buildings go towards the arts and things like that. And then when there's, you know, when there's lean budget times, it's easy for some of the more conservative members to say, "Hey, what, why are we spending money on these these sculptures and stuff like that?" But uh, where would you say that kind of the 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 tone at the Capitol is right now towards kind of arts and culture? I don't have a full read on that yet. Um, Certainly new members, a lot of new members have told me they're interested. We have a new music educator from Stillwater, Representative Trish Ranson. We have other people who have connections or affiliations to arts Mm -hmm. or arts education. So that's been fun to draw those connections. But I don't know overall yet. Um, I do know it makes a difference that I'm speaking about it, talking about arts education. I've had people come to me and ask me questions already about the arts. So it's nice to have an expertise that might not have been noticed or might not have been there before. Uh, I guess we'll see. I think, it, you know, the, the rub will come if... Uh, I, there were not negative bills related to the arts this year, mm-hmm. so I think that's a good thing. Um, and then we'll watch and see through the budget process. I mean, the Oklahoma Arts Council is down 46%. Mm-hmm. OETA, our historical society, those have all been cut, and those are things that really help with our arts and culture across the state. Yeah, well, you mentioned a lieutenant governor who's really kind of uh, focused on, you know, rebranding the state and tourism and stuff like that. And I wonder if you know, the more you hear that kind of conversation towards branding, tourism, attracting, you know, new visitors to the state, there's probably a way to kind of partner with that focus to say, yeah, arts isn't just about, you know, expression. It's also can be an economic development tool as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we just, I, in my nonprofit that I used to run, Oklahomans for the Arts, we just released the economic impact study of the arts last year. It's got a strong economic impact. We bring people in from out of state. And I think those investments in marketing, and planning for communities definitely attract dollars. Um, The other thing I've really tried to emphasize is always pairing that with education. So, you know, I'm really excited that we were looking at expanding the film rebate um, to attract film and and media productions in Oklahoma. But I kept saying, I keep saying, I wanna make sure we're pairing that with growing the educational base um, and growing what, who, the the technical expertise as well as the storytelling expertise of, of kids across the state and uh, and grown-ups, you know? Yeah. So yeah. how we can connect those two things. So it's not just the economy. It's also about developing opportunities for our Oklahomans. Yeah. How um, how much in tune are you with, with local issues that, you know, aren't necessarily directly relevant to the to the legislature and the Senate? I think about issues like, you know, the school district, Oklahoma City Schools, their, their transition plan of closing schools. I mean, these are very relevant issues to your constituents, although nothing that you really have a direct involvement in. But I'm just kind of curious, how do those issues play with you? Are you hearing from constituents on those? Are you having conversations with local leaders? How do you balance staying plugged in with these issues that as a senator, you're not going to be taking a vote on, but are still kind of really relevant to your constituents? Yeah, uh, when it comes to Oklahoma City Public Schools, I'm more in tune because my kids are in the district. Mm-hmm. I've been a volunteer in the district, um, and I met with the superintendent early to make sure I was, I was aware. Um, I'm just trying to be supportive, you know, I, I, the, of school board members and of the planning processes, trying to make sure communities feel informed. Um, I've gotten to meet with Putnam City's uh, superintendent and Bethany, and that's been helpful to me because I didn't have as much knowledge in those areas. So, I mean, just trying to make sure they're communicating with us about issues that impact them. You know, I might not be able to help something overnight, but sometimes me asking a question or me planning for something for next year might help. Um, I need to get to know uh, Western Heights better. That's also my district. Um, but it is. It's time. How do you keep up on it? So I'm obviously more in the know on OKCPS. Yeah. Uh, well, in, in your new role as a Senate, are you having fun? Are you enjoying it? You know, I, I've, I have not found the right word because fun isn't quite <laughs> yeah. what it is, but it feels important. It feels um, I'm certainly glad to be there. 
Um, even in the hard times, I feel like I'm glad to be there and have a vote, and I know I'm taking it seriously. Um, so that that's it's meaningful to me. Yeah, it feels worth it. I mean, yeah. all the I mean, you put a lot of hard work in to get to get yeah. to this spot. I mean, it don't feels, ask me in May. I, yeah. I hear that it, you just get worn down. But yeah, no, definitely. I mean, what an experience I'm having, um, and I just feel honored to represent the people I do. Every day I get to meet and learn about new parts of our state. Like for a curious person, this is the most mm -hmm. amazing job possible because we're offered information about, you know, I might in one day talk to Oklahoma City Community College and, um, and the Aggregates um, Association and someone representing a whole different aspect of economic development that I didn't know about. So, I mean, th the breadth of what our state government does is pretty amazing. Um, and trying to get a handle on that is going to take years, no doubt. But I just am blown away by getting the opportunity. Yeah. What's been the most frustrating part so far? I'm, I think pace um, and feeling like maybe we, we, we don't always flesh out things as much as we can. You know, a lot of it feels like um, I've worked on movies before and it feels like kind of hurry up and wait where you're preparing. But why some things aren't an emergency. So I certainly there's some legislation that I think doesn't have to be pu pushed through when it's still in progress. So we had a lot of bills last week where the author said, this is a work in progress. I'll be working on this more. I'm striking the title, which means it's going to slow it down. But why, do, why does it have to go through now? Why mm -hmm. can't we think it through and make sure it's well done? Um, you know, maybe a couple years from now, I'll feel differently. But right now I'm like, D maybe we could do it next year. You know, like yeah. if it's not done yet, let's do it now. Um, and then the other frustrating thing I think is making sure that legislation and policy is in consultation with people. Um, you know, be it advocacy groups, be it the agencies themselves. You know, there's a lot of bills put forward about agencies without any consultation. And they might be wanting to change the way the agency operates, but I hope they talk about consequences with that. So I think just the haste that we're moving along sometimes is a little frustrating. Yeah. In the first bill we saw come out, uh, the permitless carry this week, um, I mean, I don't know if you have anything else to say except that you were against it, but uh, I mean, your thoughts on, yeah, on um, that could be in the first <coughs> bill to come out of the legislature and, and signed? I just don't see permitless carry as a priority. You know, I don't s for public health, for public safety. You know, we want to talk about education. And certainly what I heard from my district was they weren't worried about their gun rights. They already have strong, solid gun rights in place. Um, and this actually brings guns into a public spaces in a more um, visible and, you know, at least based on research, dangerous way. Um, so I, I have grave concerns about that bill. Um, and I guess now it's a law. Um, and the fact that it was moved through so quickly was was disconcerting to me because I don't understand why that was the number one priority. Um, and I hope people think about that in terms of what, what we hope for our state is, do we want to start with guns? Is that number one? Um, I hope that we can shift the conversation more to health mm -hmm. and more to education and those things that are going to build up our state. Yeah. You talk about your, what your constituents thought on this and, you know, a lot of them felt like they already had good gun rights. I mean, you have a, when I mean, you come from, you know, it's a pretty purple district, right? I mean, it's, you know, it's a democratic district that you flipped this last year. Um, you know, Republican. a lot of, or, or well, it's Democrat now. I mean, I mean, in terms of like, has oh, a democratic yeah, yeah, yeah. senator. Yes. Say, there's more yeah. registered yeah, Republicans but I mean, by but far. But on the map, it's listed as yeah. a Democrat because you're a Democrat. Um, you know, the House districts seem to be, they can be more, you know, partisan one way or the other. Senate sometimes has the tendency to be a little bit more um, purplish, but still not much. But maybe your district may be one of the more, you know, purplish in the in the state, given the fact that there are more registered Republicans, but they did elect a Democrat. So you kind of have a unique perspective on what, you know, Republicans, you know, maybe even if they're moderate Republicans are kind of thinking on some of these issues. So isn't, I, I guess my point is that, um, you know, I would expect like, you know, Representative Virgin from Norman that her district would be adamantly against a very progressive district. But yours, you're talking to Republicans who are for gun rights and are still telling you that this wasn't necessarily a priority for them. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, I, I lived that by walking the streets. And of course, I didn't talk to every voter. And I was not talking probably to some of the people who that's their number one issue, because obviously I wouldn't fit. But I was very upfront with people. Um, and, you know, frankly, I even had some people who were going to send me away because of my party because they thought that meant I would be anti-gun. And when I said, well, do you believe in background checks or do you believe in basic um, uh, safety for public spaces? They were like, absolutely. You know, I talked to retired military people, to um, police officers, and they agreed. So, I mean, part of it may have been who I was talking to. I might hear from mm -hmm. a certain part of my constituency that's not happy with that vote. Um, but the, people seemed very reasoned to me on that issue. They cared a whole lot more about functional government, education, health. You know, mental health came up 
way more often than gun rights mm-hmm. at the doors. So, so why do you think it sailed through like it did? Well, you know, there's a certain amount of people that think that's what their district wants. So I, I get it's going to take me a while to try to understand that since, I mean, we all are representing very different constituents. And I guess we'll see. Um, I also know that there's a lot of people that don't vote. Um, so I think there's the vo- a lot of the most vocal um, advocates on this issue are um, pro-gun rights. They've been organized for a long time. Um, whereas those who want common sense gun laws uh, haven't been as long. Um, we have a great group of moms demand um, common sense, mm-hmm. moms demand action, yeah. um, who have a very reasonable platform about background checks and making sure we have you know some uh, checks and balances to keep people safe. Um, you know, they just got organized a couple years ago. So it's not like there's a, a, a unified voice. I had a lot of people who really told me that they didn't imagine it would pass through so quickly, um, which, I mean, given the last year, you, we would think that it would. But anyway, I, I missed your question now. No, you but, answered. Yeah, okay. that was good. That's good. Um, so so moving forward the next couple of weeks, obviously, you have some bills that you're in favor of. Any any bills that you're kind of targeted that, you know, you want to be that, uh, uh, you know, be the one to raise important questions or you're focusing on right now, things that you think deserve a little bit more sunlight that uh, um, are going to come through your committees? Well, I don't have anything specific uh, on this, but being on the finance committee, I'm looking very closely at taxes and tax exemptions, revenues. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's not a specific initiative that I want to look at this year, but I really want to look more holistically. I've read all the incentive evaluation commission reports. They've, They've evaluated quite a few of our incentives. But how that meshes with our exemptions and our deductions and our rebates, I feel like we look at everything in isolation over there. Mm -hmm. And so I have an intern working with me on research to try to get a bigger picture view of, okay, this thing that we talk about a lot might not cost that much, but this thing over here might help, you know, 500,000 people in in this way. So I, I, I really am hoping to get a better sense of what is valuable for economic development, what is valuable for individuals' economic well-being. Um, and just find find that out better. That's something I think is important on the finance realm. Yeah. So you're talking about like tax incentives and stuff like that. So. Yeah. In in exemptions and mm-hmm. credits. Yeah. You know, last week just in in one meeting we had two different sales tax exemptions that I didn't know existed. A um, hundred percent service disabled veterans in our state are exempt from sales tax, as are. Um, of course, they were talking about the agricultural related sales tax exemption and whether how that's applied and whether it's uh, whether there's fraud in the system. Um, so. I, I was joking that I may be one of the only people left paying sales tax after I read all the sales tax exemptions. So I just want to look at the big picture of it and, and understand what we're valuing through that process. Because when we choose to exempt something or choose to rebate or credit something, we are turning down money for the general revenue fund that can be used for other priorities. So, you know, after I've spent a week listening to health and human services agencies on my appropriations committee, tell me the things they need in order to help with human well-being in our state and family stability and reducing trauma. And then I go to another uh, place and I hear about four to five million dollars of exemptions on another area. I want to make sure we're weighing that in terms of our priorities and not because that money doesn't come into the appropriations process. I think sometimes we don't weigh it as heavily. Yeah. Uh, with a couple of minutes left, I wanted to ask you one more question. And that is, um, so the, uh, the person that held your seat before, uh, Mayor David Holt, former state senator, uh, Republican. Um, so he was your senator, and now you're his senator. He's the, the mayor of Oklahoma City. I, what is that relationship like, and what? How how much is he reaching out to you now to say, hey, here's what we need as a city of Oklahoma City. Here are issues that are important to us. And I'm curious what that dynamic is like, given that he used to be the state senator in your seat. Uh, just tell us a little bit about that. Uh, you know, uh, Mayor Holt's been, uh, he's been trying to bring our whole delegation together. Okay. And I think he's... I, I understand it to be more of an emphasis on that, making sure that people know they represent Oklahoma City, because there's people like me who clearly know it. But I'm um, like, for instance, Senator Brenda Stanley, she views herself as a Midwest City senator, mm-hmm. but she's got a huge swath of Oklahoma City in her district. And so um, Mayor Holt really brought us together, trying to make sure we see ourselves as connected. Um, and of course, City of Oklahoma City has a specific agenda. I haven't heard from him that much. I think he knows. Um, as a freshman, how little power I have, frankly. <laughs> yeah. um, but he also is staying neutral on a lot of things. I think he knows that there's a lot of um, parts that the city can't weigh in on. He has encouraged us to be in connection with Tulsa around oh. urban issues because there's a very strong rural caucus. And make sure we're thinking through um, how important it is that, that cities um, speak up for their needs as well. Um, so that's been good. You know, every time I see Mayor Holt, I feel like I should have a list of about 20 things to ask him. And I usually blank out and can't think of it. So, yeah. but he's always he's very available to me. So that's great. yeah. 
Well, I mean, he probably has, should have a list of questions to ask you. As, Maybe so. Maybe as well, so. <laughs> given your position. Well, you mentioned kind of the, the important, you know, changes to sales tax and exemptions and stuff like that. Obviously, those are big issues to, to cities. And so I'm um, just kind of curious to see what is on their legislative agenda and how much they're 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 working with you or, or reaching out to you. So, mm-hmm. Well, uh, Senator Kurt, thank you so much for your time. Sure. I think this is your third time on the show yeah. or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, that's got to that's got to be just getting old hat. It's great. Yeah, that's got to be that's got to be near the top of the list yeah. on, <laughs> on, on our on our guests. But uh, we we always appreciate it. So uh, thanks again for your time and uh, good luck moving forward. Thank you. Yeah, well, that's going to do it for this week's episode of the Political State Podcast. You can find this in every episode at newsok.com, on the Oklahoman's YouTube page, and on your favorite podcasting app. I'm Ben Felder for The Oklahoman. We'll see you again for another episode next week.